Last time we talked about two level theories and the distinction between a surface level of uh, the world and ourselves as we appear to us. The world, as it seems to be, consisting of ordinary objects, uh, people, things, animals, and so forth. And then a deeper level, a level of theoretical objects that is meant to explain the activity of things at the surface level. So that might be the world of molecules as described by the scientific theories of the scientific revolution. It might be Freudian psychology. It might be evolutionary theory. It might be a variety of other things that are operating at a more basic hidden level. And the problem we saw at the end of last time is that if such a theory is correct, it seems as if we are to some extent strangers to ourselves, as if we really don't understand much of the time what we're doing and why we're doing. Now, that kind of theory is not by itself problematic in other ways. It's not as if there's something wrong with such theories, but they pose a very serious puzzle for us. Namely, if such a theory is right, ultimately, then what does it mean to be human? It's not just a question of the gap between is and ought, but that's the dimension of what we were talking about last time. It's really the question of what it means to be a human being, what it means to live and act and think in a world that is ultimately just a world of microphysical particles and fields, for example, or of competing subconscious forces, or of competing economic forces, or whatever the theory describes as being at that basic deep level. Well, we talked about those problems at the end of last time, and I want to elaborate that a little more. To do, a, to do that throughout the course, really, we need a bit of terminology. So I want to take some terms from one of the greatest 20th century philosophers, Wilfred Sellers. He, had, he was very concerned about this problem and introduced a terminology that I think is immensely helpful for thinking about the difficulties. Let's start with his definition of philosophy. It's a very, very broad definition. It will seem at first like not a very helpful one, but actually I think it's an extremely illuminating one. Let me start that again. The aim of philosophy, abstractly formulated, is to understand how things, in the broadest possible sense of the term, hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term. The idea is that the individual sciences describe individual parts of the world, aspects of our overall picture of the world. And so physics talks about physical objects and their interactions. Biology talks about life. Astronomy talks about the heavenly bodies and the universe as a whole. We've got other sorts of theories, psychology, the study of the mind, sociology, the study of society. But how do all these relate together? And in particular, what does it mean to be human in a world which we understand in terms of so many different kinds of theories. That really is the problem of philosophy, how we put all those things together into an overall picture. Now, Seller says this really wouldn't be so hard, except for the fact that there are two different kinds of pictures, two different kinds of images that we confront when we think about the world and ourselves. The philosopher is confronted not by one complex, many-dimensional picture, the unity of which, such as it is, he must come to appreciate, but by two pictures of essentially the same order of complexity, each of which purports to be a complete picture of man in the world, and which after separate scrutiny he must fuse into one vision. Sellers calls these two perspectives the manifest image and the scientific image. And the problem of philosophy, he says, is really something like the problem of stereoscopic vision, how to combine two different images into a unified picture. Now, our eyes do that all the time. As beings with two different eyes, we take these slightly different images and we put them together. This is how the brain perceives things as being in three dimensions, even though it's given two-dimensional images on the retina. It takes two two-dimensional images, uh, images that puts them together and gives us three-dimensionality. Well, philosophy has to do something like the same thing. It has to take a picture of ourselves that is developed in the sciences but also the picture we have of ourselves in everyday life, and somehow put those together into a view of what it is to be a human being in the world. How do we do it? Well, each of those images seems to be a complete image. The manifest image is our ordinary way of thinking about how we interact in the world. It's of ourselves as agents who act, who think, who have desires. And so he says, these are really supplementary ways. It's the framework in terms of which man came to be aware of himself as man in the world. In other words, it's our ordinary way of thinking about things. We began thinking of the world as consisting of objects. We recognized that we were objects in that world. We began thinking about ourselves. And so that partly unreflective and partly reflective picture of who we are is part of what defines the manifest image. But this is not all there is to it. Um, if we think about the objects here, 
The basic objects of the manifest image, he says, are persons, animals, lower forms of life, merely material things like rivers and stones. At one point, he says cabbages and canes. Um, there is a good example of a, an inhabitant of the manifest image. Actually, it's a sad picture. As Facebook reminded me the other day, it was almost exactly a year ago that Freckles died. Um, it's sad. She was a wonderful cat. But so is not to depress you. I'll show you another image <laughs> from the manifest image. Uh, that looks like, that isn't one of my cats, but it really looks like one. Uh, anyway. The scientific image is a different image of ourselves and of the world. It's of the world as consisting, for example, of microparticles, of ourselves as being physical beings driven by physical forces. It is of a world that is controlled by maybe unconscious psychological forces or economic forces or a variety of other kinds of forces that social scientists, that psychologists, that physicists and others have proposed as being fundamental to the way the world works. And so as soon as you get, you might say, the introduction of theoretical objects, things that are not themselves observable, something dramatic changes. Over the weekend, one of you sent me a question saying it was unclear to you how this idea of the two-level theory is connected to the basic theses of the Enlightenment, to the theses of truth and knowledge and objectivity and progress and so on. And I said, well, actually, here's the thing. Something new happens. As long as we're just describing things that are visible to us, then it's one issue. We can do that at a level that still remains within the framework of a manifest image. When somebody like Galileo is just looking up at the stars and he's charting their movements, that's something that we can do within the framework of the manifest image itself. But as soon as we introduce something new, some sort of theoretical object, some theoretical entity like an atom or a quark, a proton, something that is really not directly observable, and it doesn't have to be physical. Yet it could be the id, the ego, the superego. It could be some other kind of consideration. Whatever it is, we introduce this, and now suddenly we have the two-level theory. We're not just describing one thing within the, within the framework that we're given already. We've got a complicated issue now. We're trying to connect what you might describe as the macro-level image we have of the world, the manifest image, and the micro-level image we have at the level of the scientific image. Science gives us a picture of the world and of ourselves that is, in some sense, hidden. The true nature of things is not directly observable. Something else is going on at some more fundamental level. And so we get this sort of picture. And this is why it becomes a problem for the humanities, for thinking about what it is to be a human being. We realize at the manifest image level, the surface level, we think of ourselves as rational beings. This is on a level of rationality of morality, we do things and act in ways that are sometimes good, sometimes bad, sometimes right, sometimes wrong. We take or fail to take responsibility, but in any case, we have responsibility for our actions. We make decisions, we make choices, we act, and we have to take the responsibility for what we do. We also, within that realm, think of ourselves as free. We engage in practical reason. We say, why should I do that? We think about problems and try to find solutions. Now, at the level of the scientific image, things look very different. The world seems to be governed by either causal, well, either deterministic causal laws or statistical laws, as in quantum mechanics. Um, the science seems to be valued through three. There really are terms like obligation, responsibility, right, wrong, good, bad, within the framework of that. Imagine a physics class if someone says, OK, the speed of light is this. You say, was well, that good or bad? <laughs> I think it's wrong, right? I just think it's wrong for light to go that fast. It's speeding. Um, that, that, there's, uh, there's no way to make sense of that claim, right, within the framework of physics itself. And so, moreover, within that realm, either things appear to be purely determined, which is the way they seem to be at the end of the 19th century, before quantum mechanics, or at any rate, they seem statistically driven. So either we get determination or we get randomness, but in neither case do we really seem to get anything like rationality or morality. And so we face a problem in understanding what it is to be human. We thought we understood that in terms of being rational agents in a complex world trying to stay alive and solve problems. And then we get this picture of the world and of ourselves that implies actually we're not making decisions, we're not acting freely, and there's no point in talking about responsibility. So in that sense, there really is a clash of these images. There are conflicting claims, competing claims. The scientific image 
claims to be a complete picture of the world. The scientist basically says, I'm going to give you a theory that accounts for the motion of physical particles, for example, and explains everything about what happens in the world, including your behavior. And it's that completeness claim that gets scary. Because wait, <laughs> what room is left now for rationality, for decision making, for freedom, if everything is ultimately to be explained in terms of the sciences? There's a marvelous sculpture in the middle of the river in Berlin that illustrates this. It's called Molecule Man. And we have actually several figures grappling and fighting it out in the middle of the river. Um, well, anyway, <laughs> what really is the key difference between the manifest image and the scientific image? We've already talked about the difference between observability and being a theoretical entity that is unobservable. That's one crucial difference. But really, the key difference, according to Sellers, is normativity. It's the gap between is and ought. The irreducibility of the personal, that is to say, the manifest image, is the irreducibility of the ought to the is. Now, there's a long argument in the background for that. I used to have you all read that in this course at the very beginning. It simply discouraged everyone, because Sellers is one of those difficult writers of the 20th century. And so I decided I will just talk about it, and not actually make you read it. But that's the key idea. What really is distinctive about this manifest image, it is the idea of rationality, of morality, of normativity, of our judgments of things as being right or wrong, correct or incorrect. That seems to have no place in the scientific image. And so the central tension between these two images is really precisely that problem that we were discussing last time, the problem of normativity. Well, Sellers describes that in terms of a gap between the realm of law and the space of reasons. If the irreducible element of the manifest image is normativity, this idea of norms, of something that goes beyond really describing the world, then we've got a contrast between the realm of law that science gives us, where everything seems to be determined according to laws, and then the conception of ourselves where we are rational agents. We are acting for reasons. And that is what he refers to as the space of reasons. It is a different realm. It's not as if the electrons are doing their things over here, and then my mind is doing its thing over there. In some way, they're involved in the same realm, but at the very least, two very way, different ways of understanding the same thing. But if that's right, if they are two different ways of understanding the same thing, then how do we put them together? How do we manage to fuse a unified picture of what it is to be a man in the world? We seem to be in the same position of those grappling figures in Berlin who are really made of molecules and yet trying to act as human beings, but how, in a mechanistic sort of world, is that even possible? So to put it dramatically, we could say in the manifest image, we think of ourselves as free, we're acting for reasons, we act rightly or wrongly, virtuously or viciously, we take or fail to take responsibility, in any case we have responsibility, but according to the scientific image, all of that is misleading. We're really determined by something we can't be aware of, or at least aren't conscious of normally. Maybe through learning science, we can actually become aware of it in the abstract, and we're still not going to be aware of it as it happens. It's not as if I can think, ooh, hunger. <laughs> Gee, there were some neural firings there, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to be aware of that. Our reasons are going to emerge here as mere rationalizations of something that's actually governed by law. Morality will look like nonsense, or like some sort of uh, indirect way of describing something else. And since we are free, it doesn't seem to make any sense to talk about responsibility. So Sellers, but really the enlightenment and the project of uncovering and explaining the behavior of things in the manifest image in terms of an underlying depth level, seems to leave us in that kind of position. How do we put the scientific image and our ordinary manifest image of ourselves together? 